He hustling. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Oh, no, I'm absolutely wrong, but it's fun to talk about, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> so, so there's two... All right, guys, welcome back to another episode, of course, of Global Wine News, uh, where we tear apart or tease apart a couple of bite-sized pieces of information from across the, the recent weeks uh, in the wine industry. Um, and this week, we have three chunky ones, starting off from Decanter and Wine Spectator have actually just covered this. And it's been a piece of wine news that has been uh, pretty forefront in a lot of sort of pop culture. Um, U.S. deports convicted wine fraudster Rudy. Now I'm going to butcher this last name. Is it Colonel One? Colonel One. He's an Indonesian uh, national. That um, I'm not sure if you've ever seen the uh, Netflix doco Sour Graves. I personally have not. No. Have you Have you heard uh, of this guy? I, w- I watched the first half. So there's both not just a Netflix special about it, but a book also written about this, uh, yeah. about the Jefferson bottles uh, and uh, uh, a billionaire basically being frauded. Uh, by uh, Mr. Rudy here, so he's known as Dr. Conti. So basically, this guy, this because yeah, do, named after uh, DRC Domain uh, della Romani Conti, the most I guess prestigious and, and expensive uh, wine on the secondary market, and that's where he sort of like basically doctored these wines. Right. He was selling. He realized that there was like you could sell wines for tens of thousands of dollars right. to people that would never open them. And they would just sell them to somebody else, and then sell them to somebody else, and then sell them to somebody else. And so, yeah, yeah. So he literally, um, uh, he would be like copying like the corks. He would actually pull legitimate old corks from like 1970s bottles and then claim they were from 1940s bottles. But it all started to come down um, when, uh, well, in 2006, he reached the pinnacle as a wine dealer. He sold $34 million worth of wine at two auctions. Wow. And it's, most of it was fake. It's a good day at the office. Yeah, most of it was fake. Uh, in 2012, the FBI knocked at his door. They found a fake wine assembly line uh, in his uh, Los Angeles kitchen, including phony labels of some of the world's rarest wines, custom stamps, and rare French wax used for sealing bottles. Um, but the best one was there was 22 lots at this like auction. There's 22 lots of Burgundies from Domaine Ponceau, which is a quite a respected estate. Yeah. Um, Laurent Ponceau <laughs> looked at this and was like, uh, we didn't even make wine in that vintage. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy clearly didn't, didn't do, do his it. research, yeah. But he still sold the wine to people that were willing to pay like six, seven, eight thousand dollars a bottle. I've got a hot take for you. Okay. I reckon this guy's in the right. You reckon? It- I reckon he's done oh. absolutely. So when you think about wine, so when we talk about wine, right? Okay. If you talk about like a really nice glass of wine, how do you appreciate that glass of wine? Okay. By drinking it. Correct. So, yeah. so- yeah. correct. Okay, let's If not... we're talking about faking portraits, like a fake Mona Lisa, how do you enjoy the Mona Lisa? You see it. Okay. Am I wrong? You're not wrong. So if your only reason is for it... buying a bottle of wine is to be able to have your, that bottle of wine on your shelf, you're never going to drink it because it's so rare, so rich. Totally. You're drink it. No, yeah. you're right. Okay. This is the world according if to you're, Henry. If you're flogging, if you are absolutely ripping that person off, why do we care? They're Does... never going to drink it. So, but you don't own the Mona Lisa. No, I do not. No, <laughs> you're absolutely no, correct. As in you don't own the Mona Lisa, as in, but you paid the Mona Lisa price to own the Mona Lisa, but it ain't and the Mona, Mona Lisa. Lisa. Or it's, yeah, it's, NFTs. A, it's, a, yeah. it's a photo exactly. of the Mona Lisa. Yeah, <laughs> NFTs, baby! Yeah, this is NFT. Like, no, you, you, like, if you're buying that bottle of wine, you want the literal value of owning that bottle of wine, right. not the uh, per- perceived value of that bottle like, of wine. Right. I am completely, like, I see where you're coming from. Yeah. You are inherently incorrect. <laughs> because I'm not these, saying I'm not. Because what's I'm happening? Everyman. <laughs> yeah. I'm but, an idiot. but this guy, this guy is essentially demanding, the, you know, super high prices yep. for, uh, you know, the legitimate prices to sell the legitimate thing that has the legitimate value. The moment it announces as a fake or a replica, yeah, then people just it's not worth as much as what he's selling it for. So therefore, yep. it's fraud to the degree of thirty-four million bucks. You know, like he's really out outing like a he, whole bunch of he hustling. Yeah, man, absolutely. Oh, no, I'm absolutely wrong, but it's fun to talk about, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> so, so there's two, if you guys want a little bit more information on this, um, uh, I got sort of really deep into this a couple of years ago. I thought it was a fascinating story, one of the most, uh, I guess, thrilling stories you can hear in the world of wine. Sour Grapes on Netflix and yeah. A Billionaire's Vinegar is the book. It's a yeah. fantastic book. And then you've also got now companies that have now uh, tried to create um, technology technologies to make it impossible to do this. There's a company in Australia called Seller without the, the A, at C-E-L-L-R. 
uh, but inventing basically um, QR codes or like little tablets you put on the top of wine. If you can scan, it, that means it's verified by the winery itself. So you can't get into the situation ever again. Well, have you guys seen what's happened in like um, China with Ben Folds? Which, if I was Ben no. Folds the musician, I would be taking that to the back. I know, right? <laughs> but then there's like Henschke Hill of, there's many different hills yeah. of Henschke inside China. You know, Hill of Red. Bill of, know, Grace. Bill of Grace. Bill of Grace. Moving on to the Shouts reported. Uh, this one's a really fun one. Handpicked. Handpicked is a, 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 a really interesting wine brand. Opens a Melbourne CBD cellar door. A luxury cellar door in the heart of Melbourne at the high end precinct, 80 Collins. Yeah. So this actually mimics their, they've got one in Sydney in Chippendale, right near Automata, you know, right near like an amazing wow. sort of restaurant precinct in, in Chippendale. Um, now, wine. I think we always associate wine brands with being, you know, in location, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so you go up, you go out to a yep. rural area, you see a lovely vineyard, that's where you visit the winery. Yep. But when it comes to things like breweries, pubs and, and whatnot, it's a little bit of a different game. Like we we really don't associate beer and wine as being, you know, the same yep. sort of thing. We can have, you know, we reference Brewdog quite often. Uh, you know, amazing brewery based in Scotland that uh, has opened up all of these, uh, you know, different Brewdog bars around the world. Um, how do we feel about wineries bringing that sort of sense of sort of rural luxury romance into the CBD? You know, CBDs aren't necessarily... I'm, I'm all for it. Um, I think it's a great way to literally get in front of the people that are interested in such a product. Um, it's not the first example of it, and it's certainly not going to be the last. Um, in Melbourne alone, there's even there's places like Jam Sheet, amazing uh, wine producer that gets a lot of fruit in the Yarra Valley. Their winery and cellar door and bar is based in Preston. Cool. Like, that's the most Melbourne thing ever. Um, uh, I, I think it's great. Um, there's examples of it across the country. Havilar in Tasmania, wine bar, but it also acts as uh, two ton Tasmania cellar door, all that kind of thing. Um, mm. It's not necessarily about um, connecting you to the place, which is probably the problem um, of the entire thing. But again, at the end of the day, you're creating an experience for people who enjoy your product, like just play on. Would you go to a, uh, a a winery cellar door? So not a production facility, mm. but a cellar mm. door mm. that offers a retail wine shop, integrated tasting pods, a cheese and charcuterie and wine bar, an experience room for wine flights in the CBD? I mean, here's the thing. I live in Adelaide, so there's no need to, because if I lived on, if I was in Fair Sydney, shot. if yeah. I lived in Melbourne, then yeah, I live an hour and a half away from anywhere that I can go to get that sort of yeah. experience. But I live in Adelaide, so like I can take a bus from the centre of the Adelaide CBD mm -hmm. to T2 Plaza to the hills in in half an hour. Yeah. Go get wines, go get cheeses, have this amazing afternoon experience. If I lived in Melbourne or Sydney and it was going to take me an hour to get into the CBD and that's so, the only way that I could have this like unique wine and cheese experience, then yes, I would do that. So here, here's, here's the problem that comes to like, I think the modern winemaking, uh, like young people creating their own little wine brands don't have the venues or spaces. They generally rent mm -hmm. out communal lots like uh, cold stores in the Adelaide Hills or warehouses um, or something like that. It's not like you're going to see a vineyard. If you go to their cellar door, it's literally a shed. Yeah. And it's not the most comfortable thing. Um, whereas if you're, you can actually justify having a, a lease in the city, you can generate a higher foot traffic to go to your venue um, yeah. to experience that product. No, I entirely agree. Like I'm, um, what, I'm not trying to be a smart ass with that last comment, but like in yeah, terms sure. of like, if you're in one of those bigger cities where it takes a long time to get yeah. out to the country, like out to a vineyard, like out to a wine region, yeah. then it makes absolute sense to have that like cellar door experience somewhere that's accessible to people. It's not difficult to get to. Yeah. But if you're in a state like South Australia or in a town like Adelaide, it's super easy to get from the CBD up to one of these regions in half an hour, 45 well, minutes. There's the flip side to this as Shots well. Shots at you, Victoria. Sorry, <laughs> fuck Victoria. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm, sure, I'm, just, I'm just an innocent Queenslander caught in the middle. Um, but uh, no, Fucking what I find really, it actually works the opposite. Like there's there's two ways this could work. Yeah, so yeah. obviously they're opening up a venue in Melbourne. I think we all agree that Melbourne's, you know, Epicurean scene is off the hook. Hey, it's oh, incredible. Their restaurants are nuts. The wine bars are nuts. This thing- The culture the, of going out to going out is mental. It's mental. Oh, it's mental. Heaps, 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 Even heaps. in Sydney as well. So like, you know, we often, you know, with wineries up in rural areas, because we're destinations, 
we kind of get away with maybe not offering that that degree of perfection in mm. terms of the venue and the, and the offering because we've got the location that does most of the work for us. Yeah, people are willing to forgive you because you are in a rural area that you know it is a special thing that they're coming up to to do it. So this this place will need to like compete really well and that's really if it's true. selling no, wines so fair. to the pub or club next yeah. door you know and it's yeah. taking their customers it's and competing yeah. for the same level of customers it's it's a tough yeah. thing to juggle right yeah i'm, I'm just to see what i haven't had too many hand-picked wines so let's see what that was your taste on the show one day that'd be interesting actually. that would be interesting see uh because they've got a really interesting model actually if you uh give them a bit of a google we'll link it in the description below hand-picked really really interesting wine model um moving onwards the australian beer and brewer reported this one this was a good one tainted love Beers give smoky grapes a bright side. So, is this the wildflower thing? Wildflower thing. Yeah, yeah, you've heard of it, have you? Uh, I'm a big no. fan of wildflower. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Sorry, obviously so, not. Yeah. Wildflower Brewing, uh, uh, based in Sydney, absolutely incredible uh, uh, brewer that mucks around with uh, that ingredients, wild ferments, they're yeah. doing some really sort they've, of... They've created a house culture yeast strain based off native flowers from New South Wales, so it is basically Australian wild nails. It's That's pretty mental. Like Sourdough for booze? Are we doing that? A little bit like that. A little bit like that. Sourdough yeah. for booze. Um, but Brian Martin, a great winemaker that we all love from Ravensworth Wines and Murray Bateman, um, has basically teamed up with the guys uh, behind Wildflower and they've released six different, uh, six different wines, I believe, or five different wines. Yeah. Um, that are hand harvested, carbonic macerated, whole bunch uh, grapes that have been blended for eight months with Wildflower's own uh, freshly fermented mixed culture wild ale gold as their base. Um, and so they've got the, it's called the Bright Side. Mm. You know, always mm. looking at the bright side of life. Bright Side Shiraz, Bright Side Gamay, Bright Side Riesling, Bright Side Viognier, Bright Side Sangiovese. Now, we spoke a lot last year on the show yeah. about beer wine hybrids. Mm -hmm. This is one of the most interesting ones because they talk about how smokiness like we encountered this as a winery as yeah. well with bushfires in our area and where people were like oh my god it's going to be yeah. smoke tainted and then i was looking at it from a bit of a different perspective going well who's to say that smoke's a bad bad Flavor, thing in fact yeah. in terms of a lot of flavors that that are smoky we work really hard to get them into wines quite often particularly with expensive oak or with lignified stems whole bunch work and stuff like that Mate. So, dead set, like this weekend, just up at Applewood, I've had, uh, I had a group of people in, they were drinking the Unico Zello wine flight, and we had the Harvest Pinot Gris on there, mm -hmm. and obviously the Harvest, coming from last year in the Adelaide Hood, Hills. the Adelaide Hills, sorry, she's gone, oh, that's lovely smoky flavour in there, and I've gone, yeah, well, look, absolutely, that's where it's come from, and that's an example of like, we, but we haven't, it's an example of the vintage, put that in there, yeah, like yeah. that's just an example yeah. year to year, that's what you're yeah. going to get. And people have been, yeah, some people have been sort of like, oh my God, you know, the, the, the smoking is a little bit weird, but I find it fascinating with this sort of take here because in wine, we have this really heavy preconceived idea of what? Smoke bad. Or just what wine has to be. Yeah. And as Smoke soon as you, yeah, yeah, basically that's, it's in effect, that's no, exactly it. what's going on. Um, and so, but in beer, beer seems to get away with a whole bunch of awesome, really stylistic, well, weird shit. I have had uh, a, a beer from this producer only the other week that Wildflower did a takeover in NOLA just down the road and they had a smoked malt beer cool. and it tasted fantastic and yeah. I was like great and then I heard about this project um, and I was like this makes complete sense and it's good to see them actually test the um, the waters with this you know, with, with, with like a smoked well beer, and there's like, I let's see how it works with wine grapes. They're not uh, new to make with smoky beers. They're not new to wine influenced yeah. beers either. This is going to be an awesome project. I'm really excited to see how it tastes. And they're actually what I found out probably last week is that they're touring the country. So Brian yes. Brian yeah. Martin and Todd Brown, who's the the brewer, are touring around Australia and doing uh, tastings and pop up events at a whole bunch of pubs. So they're hey, coming. They're, let's, let's get them in. No, no, do it. We should get them in. No, they're doing a pop up at the Wheaty. Oh, bro, I live around the corner from the Wheaty. Let's go to the Wheaty. Saturday. Do a show. What are we talking yeah, about? Like, so like they're doing a whole bunch of things all across the country uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully, by the time this gets up, you'll be able to see it. Um, Awesome. Uh, on that note, guys, uh, thank you for driving in. Hopefully that's been mildly useful and wildly entertaining. Um, uh, we will catch you, I guess, uh, in a week with more news. Ciao.